It's a pleasure to be here, um, and it's a pleasure to be connected to humanitarian designers. What I usually like to do, well, let me first say a little bit my, my sort of big chunks of life to, to explain why I'm coming to all of this. So first of all, I mean, my first, I grew up in Berlin, 18 years, and that was all I lived in Germany ever. Um, I quit for southern France, and I was involved, and this is, was actually my first development project. I was involved in, in an area in the Pyrenees, uh, not far from Andorra, at 1,000 meters altitude, overaged population, all the young people had left, um, backwards, development context, I mean, poverty, people still working with oxen, and I mean, really, you were in the, in the 18th, 19th century or something, and that was in 1980. I mean, development context, sure. So there comes a bunch of hippies from, from uh, other parts of France, from other parts of Europe, and we settle there, it's cheap, and so on, and we de develop basically the place. A development nobody called a development. It was a place where we were living, where we were working, where we were doing things because there was space to be taken. We set up, and I was a roofer, became a roofer, uh, ardoisier, a couvreur uh, ardoisier. Um, <clears throat> so we were doing things where there was nobody. There was no artisans, there was no services, there was no schools, any, I mean, there was nothing. So we made babies, we created uh, jobs for uh, people coming in. I mean, it was a natural sort of growth of a system. The local people hated us. I mean, we, we were like the migrants, the, the Syrians, the, the Africans, the Muslims in, in Europe. So they felt the same. They hated us. They were, I mean, they were even trying to shoot at us and throwing stones and so on. But this whole area somehow took like 20-something years, developed. So it's today a thriving, a thriving zone with sustainable tourism, you can do activ activities, there's jobs, the schools are open, there's shops, and so on, so there is a life possible. The village, the Amo, where I have my house, it used to be three houses, now it's, I think, 12 or 13 houses inhabited. You can buy everything in the village. First development project. Second, then I took my motorbike, I went uh, through the Sahara and ended up in Mali, and I met in a bar some people doing aid work, they were the first aid workers I met, um, and I, they were building a school and they didn't know how to build a school. But they were building a school because they were working for an NGO. Um, and then, so I said, I help you. But then again, what was my qualification? I'd never worked in that context. I mean, all what I was, it was white, male, could read and write, and was somehow involved in construction work. But I stayed six months building the school. So from there, I got recruited by... ACF to work in Uganda to manage a vocational training center. Never ever in my life, I mean, I was a roofer, so I have been training people on the job, but never in my life had been setting up a vocational training center, but I got a job as a vocational training center manager, setting uh, something up like this with the Ministry of Labor and so on and so forth. My qualification, white, male, reading and writing. It didn't feel good, but at the, same, at the time I thought I was saving the world. So at that period then I met again, and I was tell everybody, anybody, designers, architects, students of any form, go to bars, socialize, that's how you get jobs. So I, I met some people from the United Nations, and I was recruited in, um, in the early 90s to go to southern Sudan. Yeah, cool. Um, and I ended up doing heavy, heavy stuff in the middle of a war, and that's where suddenly reality sank in. Actually, it's not that um, romantic and cool when you're in the middle of a battlefield and when people die and, trust me, death stinks. I mean, it's really, it's really, it was a total change of my life. That's where humanitarian work is not so romantic anymore. That's real stuff. When you see people being killed, people being cut in pieces and so on and so forth. Um, and then by, by accident, I ended up in UNHCR, fleeing with 20,000 people across the border one night from southern Sudan to northeastern, uh, to northwestern Kenya. So that's where I set up a, um, a, a, a refugee camp. It still exists today, Kakuma refugee camp with over 200,000 refugees. Uh, but what was my qualification to set up refugee camps? Nothing. A bit of common sense being used to bush work and so on, but again, I'm the foreigner, I'm white, I'm male, 
um, can read and write, and I'm trustworthy because I'm white, and so on. I'm not corrupt, of course. Um, so that's uh, started a career in Yonet Shia, and then I went through Yonet Shia, through different, different levels within the United Nations. I was in Mogadishu during the famous Black Hawk Down uh, episode, so I was in Sri Lanka, it was many, many places, war zones. Um, Pakistan after the earthquake um, in 2005 and 2006. Um, sp spent five years in Pakistan, uh, flooding in Pakistan in 2010 with 17 million people affected by climate change displacement, I mean by climate change uh, flooding. These are sort of the big things. Was involved in many, many operations. I'm, I, I'm, I don't get into details here. But then comes the period when I was sent to, to Jordan, not to Syria, to Jordan, to, uh, to not to set up, but to clean out a Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Cleaning out in the sense that it was a totally screwed up operation by the humanitarian system. How? Well, I mean, there was the war which, which started in Syria in 2011. Conflict and it gets into war. And then people start moving and into Jordan and other countries in the region. And of course, first they go into the villages and towns, and at some point, um, the Jordanian government asks UNHCR and the humanitarian system to set up a refugee camp. So they do that, to the books, sphere standards, easy logistics, one hour from, from uh, um, Amman, very easy to supply everything. For the first time, I believe, all the standards tick, 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 all the boxes filled. And what happened? 100,000 excuse me, pissed off Syrians. Very angry people. Very angry people, because they were treated like commodities. They were put into a standardized, categorized, this is female under, under 40, this is male, this is this, this is that, and so on and so forth. Standardized um, assistance, not human assistance. Yes, of course, again, as Michelle was saying, life-saving is important, but there was nothing about life-saving anymore. It was Reception, yes, every night there was maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people coming. So what? Logistics, easy. But still, it was mass treatment. And then basically the perspective of putting 100,000 people into a storage facility for the next 30 years or more. And then, and I can be coming to the myth busting, which is, I think, very necessary for anybody who gets into that sector, very important. Um, then you dust them, once they have been in a shelf for 30 years, you dust them a bit and you send them home. Because the dream of every human <coughs> refugee should be to go home. So let's kill the myth of returning home. Very few people return home. Because otherwise, we would not be sitting here. Because we are a result of, mostly in our history, of forced migration. The world has been built, humanity has been built, unfortunately, on a lot of forced migration. Wars and people being pushed out and so on, famines and you name it, people have been on the move throughout history. So let's also be clear, migration equal evolution. So let's also get that message across to politicians who say stop migration. No, you cannot stop migration because we cannot, cannot and we should not stop evolution because we should be evolving into something maybe more sustainable and more responsible. So the myth of return, myth of return is something very important. And now I want to come to some of these stories, and that's why in 2014 I decided to quit. So I was managing this refugee camp in Jordan um, with roughly 100,000 uh, people from Syria. I decided to quit the UN system. And I became independent. And since then, as my third or fourth block in my life, if you want, uh, I've been working independently. I've been working with governments. Uh, quite an experience to be the special advisor to the government of Austria in 2015. So I worked with the Minister of uh, Interior. I uh, was special advisor to the German Minister for Development on refugee and displacement issues. And I was also um, then uh, developing in 2017 for the then Prime Minister Chancellor of uh, Austria, Kern, a strategy on migration management uh, 
looking at Africa from a different perspective. We called it Africa from crisis to opportunity. So working in this sort of sphere, working with private companies and so on, I set up my own company. And then we'll speak more about this in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, because I thought, well, talking about value chain, I, I didn't see anymore why I should set up an NGO, which would have been the logical sort of step for an ex-UN person. I said, no, it's not honest. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's all about creating value, profit in a way, in order to grow or at least to sustain yourself. So I set up something which I call IPA, Innovation and Planning Agency, Switchboard. And we'll come to that. I'm talking a lot about connectivity. Um, connectivity between opportunities, about not about needs, about opportunities and the resources we have globally. So the concept of the switchboard, and those who are a little bit older, remember that when we, you were calling New York at the time, you had to, with this type of telephone, you had to call the operator, and then there was somebody there, and then was putting cables together, and then was making kr, 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 and then suddenly you had a connection to New York or to somewhere else in the world. So about the physical connectivity between, I mean, making connections in, in this digitized world which still require human contacts. That's why we are sitting here. That's why we are appreciating ourselves as well. We are establishing relationships. So and I give come to a couple of concrete um, uh, examples a little later. So a switchboard, we build partnerships, we build ecosystems. We don't think that anybody should work in isolation. And we believe really that the world, if you look at the world, and it happens to be around, it looks like a head, it looks like a brain, and what happens in the brain of a little child is synapses are opening. And that's how a child learns how to walk. That's how a child uh, learns how to speak, to reflect, becomes an adult. And that's also our, our, my philosophy, which now a lot of people have adopted and saying, our world, our globe, the better and a, a more sustainable way it is connected, the higher chances it has to survive. A lot of what can solve issues, build on the opportunities, has already been invented. But it's, in, it's stuck in one corner. It's not only about money. It's about knowledge, best practice, worst practice. It's about something totally different from our ideas of, well, uh, there is a world out there which is interconnected. Now, out of the 8 billion people, probably 5 billion are not connected, are not capable of using the resources we have the same way as people sitting in this room. I mean, we have all sorts of gadgets around here which talk about communication, which use communication. But that's maybe accessible in principle, because everybody has a phone today in many, many parts of the world, but still, how to use it? Even how to use Google in a, let's say, a way that you find really what you're looking for is sometimes very difficult. And it's very difficult for most people. So that's the concept of us being the facilitators of connectivity. So we are, we are, we are bringing people together all the time. Um, of course, we need to, and that's why we are a company, um, and a group of companies now, actually, yeah, our own ecosystem. Um, that's why, that's where we also have to, of course, to look into how do we earn our money in the middle. So we are, we are, the, we are the brokers. We are the brokers of contacts, of relationships. So now, um, a few more of these myths. So the myth of return, a good refugee doesn't have to return. A, a, a good human being or a human being wants to live and wants to move forward. Yes, there's a lot about uh, emotions and the past, but it's also about looking forward. The humanitarian sector has been brainwashed in that sense of going back. And that's, that's exactly what is holding lots of people, millions of people hostage today. When Angela Merkel in 2015 said, yes, we can do it and open the borders, she told in the same time everybody, ah, you will be, you're welcome. We will host you until you can go back, until you're not... Uh, there's no, I mean, there will be no war anymore in your country, then you go back. So the message was to the, to the hosts, I mean, 
these guys are now charity receivers for the next few years and to the others, the newcomers, you will be guests until you go home. Instead of saying, you have one year to check in, business, and then it's about business. You're part of the society. She did a big mistake. And I'm saying this loud and clear all the time. Wrong message. In Jordan, when I was managing the 100,000 Syrian refugees, was the same thing. I remember a discussion between Antonio Guterres, who at the time was the High Commissioner, and uh, the ministers from the region, the um, refugee or development ministers from the region, where they were all saying, yeah, but these people will go back. I mean, every time we were trying to do something sustainable in the camp, the, the government of Jordan was saying, no, 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 but they're all going back. Instead of getting into logic and saying, now, how do you <coughs> transform temporariness into something longer? into something sustainable. We're not saying we're building a city for a thousand years, but we're saying we're building up sustainable structures which behave the same way as the others. That's why I brought in, as a major partner in Jordan, the city of Amsterdam as a planning partner to build a city. Um, there's actually, we, uh, we could look at this, uh, watch this a little later, there's an interesting video by the Municipality Association of the Netherlands, VNG, VNG, Zatari, and that's a scenario building, future scenario building of how a temporary space can transform. So I started bringing in different other partners into, into the equation, into the context of, of the refugee camp. But UNHCR would not understand it. The NGOs would not understand it because it was also not their business model. And that's where it becomes, where I became quite angry because I discovered that um, organizations were not even interested in having sustainable, let's say, also transition to something else. I remember working with the, with the water company of Marseille and the water company Waternet of Amsterdam on developing and designing the water system. But they said, oh, but what UNICEF and the water and sanitation partners are doing is crap. It's bad. I mean, it's not sustainable. We would never build something like this in a city. But we can help you to do that if you accept. Well, the humanitarian said, no, thank you very much. Because now building the, basically we're building the water system for double the money that it would have costed even in a city. Why? Well, that's about the, the value chain where you make money with overhead costs and things like this. It's as sad as is that. So replacing, replacing some, of the, uh, some of these functions by what would be a logical sort of, let's say, sequence in a normal world is for me essential to create sustainability. Um, maybe uh, also again to put this all into context, so what, what is humanitarian work? And I think Michelle had been really very much putting in the, the let's say, the theoretical framework, the, the foundations for that. What is humanitarian work? Yes, there is, there is the emergency work which, we, which happens and which is becoming very visible to all of us. And I think I also agree of who is, who is the best responder to the crisis. It's a local structure and capacity to respond. I mean, when we had the floods now in Europe, there is maybe inter-European support between disaster management uh, uh, responders, but we don't have NGOs from all sorts from coming from all over, all over the world. Pakistan, which has been learning the hard way about crisis, has been building up a disaster management authority, which I think, and for my times, at least when I was also the deputy special envoy for assistance in Pakistan, did a decent job learning to respond to crisis. And of course, when there is a very big disaster, they need a, additional assistance from outside, but they are in the lead. So that's, that's, that's one part. Again, that's about life-saving in crisis. And we're seeing, and we will be seeing, unfortunately, more and more because of the climate uh, challenges coming very, becoming very visible, very tangible for all of us. But then already all the rest, that's the famous transition from humanitarian to development. There is very little, what I feel, is necessary to come from outside. 
accept that good practice and best practice and maybe the exchange of technology, but it has to be driven, and that's also by the, the approach by eBay Switchboard, it has to be driven by what we call opportunity um, assessment or a, a, a opportunity mapping. It has to be driven by what is actually desired uh, by, let's say, local entrepreneurs, by local, I, I don't like the word communities, because community sense sometimes difficult. It has to be driven by local um, entrepreneurship. It has to be indicated, but then recognizing that, of course, there's a lot of things they may not know even. And that's what becomes a bit difficult of how you inject new ideas, new concepts. But again, in the end, it's not up to you to dictate, as we have done in Afghanistan, and we just had a quick discussion before this, sort of informally. What has happened in Afghanistan is that we have imposed a lot of our values, NGOs have imposed values, donors have imposed values, and now, whether we want it or not, some people, and a lot of people, actually more people than we think, actually very happy that the Taliban are back and that this is all over. There's people returning from Iran and saying, yes, finally we can go home. Because we don't have that, all that Western, Western influence anymore. So, I mean, just to say, so we have to, when, when is the moment you're injecting new ideas and new concepts? We are, of course, all of us here in the room will say, yes, girls' education, number one. But how do you get that? Certainly not by conditionality, certainly not by imposing it, certainly not by, by coming as we have been doing a lot and many of the organizations are doing. So it's, it's about putting as well, again, in the forefront an evolution and sort of provoking eventually change, but that through stimulation and exposure to other people and other ideas and other institutions, exchange, visibility. So, in a world, again, of 8 billion people, that is what we, we should be doing. Um, accelerating those exchanges, that opening. A very important um, element is what I call future storytelling. Um, future storytelling helps a lot. Um, this is something, and I will soon finish, but uh, to, to talk about what we're doing in, in Tunisia, um, it helps tremendously somebody to visualize of how something could look like. It's, it's really scenario building. Um, so I worked with uh, somebody who's fascinating in that, it's Alex McDowell of the World Building Institute, the Media Lab in the University of Southern California. Um, he has been working on movie stuff, uh, has been working with uh, Steven Spielberg and others. We have been building in 2016 together the refugee camp of the future, visualizing the refugee camp of, of 2036, bringing in people concerned, bringing in designers, bringing in uh, visual art people, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, you name it. I mean, everybody was in visual arts. And we basically created the ref refugee camp of 2036 as a scenario building. But in the same way, he has been working, for instance, with a community or group of people that then becoming a community in Saudi Arabia on how, f how they would be seeing their village 20, 30 years ahead. And they ended up designing their own village. Realizing, and coming back to the girls' education part, realizing that, yes, time would advance, and of course women would have a role. And women would be driving, and women would be at school, and women would be working. But so they ended up designing their, basically their society, visualizing that. And it was a whole process of designers, artists, inter and students interacting with a group of local people. Now this village is being built, it's developing, because the authorities saw it as well. So there's ways of operating this way. Now what we are, are we doing in Tunisia, which is, I've by coincidence, settled in uh, Tunisia in 2019, set up IPA switchboard first uh, as well, near today, uh, implementing a major migration program, 
where we have uh, roughly 50 staff, 50 colleagues working in uh, six locations along the coast. Traditional donor finance, <coughs> financed by Germany, financed by Austria and the European Migration Fund. But where are we different in here? First of all, again, we are a company. So we are implementing, let's say, consulting firm in that sense. But what are we? We are a social company. So our people are working as a collective. So what we are doing is we brought, we mapped all the providers of services in, in uh, Tunisia. So 14,000 institutions, social service providers of all sorts, in a database. Now we're building that database into, into an app which becomes on one hand accessible for our own staff and for the staff of other organizations. It's not our property. We make it open source. And it's available for the clients, for the people themselves. I want to know where can I sleep tonight, where I get a, where I get a meal. I can do that on, my, on the app. Not yet for Tunisia. But how we're we going to working in co-creation here? We're working with a collective in Berlin, which has built an app like this for homeless youth in Germany. So somebody has built it already, with the support of Google Germany. Now Google Germany, we're working with Google Germany to finance the app for, for Tunisia. So that's migration management. In southern um, Tunisia, in the region of Tatawin, planet Tatawi, uh, Star Wars, for those who know. Um, that's where we, which is a region which I have chosen, yes, I've chosen. That's sort of the external thing. That didn't really come to me, but there were, I met young people there who said, we can do so much and nothing is happening. And I said, okay, let's see of how can we bring that together. And that's where we're now working, and of course COVID made it very difficult, on an acceleration of partnerships. So it's different things. We did the opportunity mapping, so what do you want to do, what are your projects, what are your ideas? And we're looking for concrete partners. So we are setting up a desert farm, 100 hect almost 100 hectares of integrated desert farm, one megawatt of solar power, 50 hectares of, of trees, uh, greenhouses, um, f uh, factory, exporting products, and so on and so forth, one thing. But we're also bringing in artists, architects, um, technicians, universities, um, tourists. Um, so we are, we are working out of an abandoned, and it's a fantastic place. I'm offering this here to everyone, as I'm always saying, the playground. Um, uh, an abandoned Berber village with 3,000 doctorate caves. Very complicated ownership issues, but that's the place where we are basically bringing people together. So we will be bringing people to, into that based on the requests from the local uh, uh, people, but sometimes also provoking change in something they've never heard about. There will be things happening. We will be introducing hydroponics. But again, hydroponics, we didn't invent. I met a young guy the other day and he says, I want to invest in hydroponics. I said, but we have hydroponics partners in Canada, in Austria, in Libya, and in Tunis, we will bring them to the desert, to you. And we will be ex equipping and building together one little farm in a Drogdolid cave house as a test, as a prototype. So that's sort of the interaction where we, 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 we look into. Again, as I'm saying, you're all welcome. Any ideas are, are welcome. I mean, it's, it's a stunning place. It's still a bit quiet. It can be more active. It shouldn't be too active as well. But that's where a lot can happen, and that's where we can actually prove the concept of connectivity at least pro uh, producing a livable or more interesting space also for young people. Again, what is the vision for the future? Let them do it. Let them design it, but then come and, and, and help in designing the process. Well, many more things to talk about, but I stop here. I think um, uh, I guess now it's time for discussion a bit. Yeah. Thank you.